Hi folks, I'm Vanessa Socket. I'm an open source developer and computer scientist. And today we are going to talk about open source introspection. So what the heck is that anyway? Well, on a high level, introspection is like this tool belt that you have to look at your own mental and emotional processes. So in the context of open source, we can say that's looking at your role and priorities when you're engaging with open source communities. Oh, hey, what's up, Rudy Rembrandt dude? That sounds hard. Indeed, it's really hard. It can take a lot of practice to really look into yourself and ask these questions. For example, it could be on the scale of very simple to complex. So a very simple question could be like, I just had this interaction and it made me feel very anxious. Why was that? To something more, you know, high level, like, oh my gosh, what is my purpose? Why am I here? As we see this cat is having this very introspective moment. So open source introspection in a very concrete sense is asking questions about your role and priorities for engaging with open source communities. Rudy Rembrandt dude again, that sounds, this guy, right? That sounds boring. Okay, so I was gonna go through this talk and present a series of questions, but since you're making me level it up one bit, I will, I will make a proposal. We will not just ask questions, we will also add stories. Specifically, I will share some stories from my personal experiences. And, and, and I am going to have my fellow, the wise uh, Yoda dog here that is going to help us alert us to when there is a story upcoming ahead. What do you think of that? Ha, ah, he's speechless. Alrighty, let's get started then. Yes, I know, I know, trust me, I know. So the first question is easy. Why am I contributing to open source? I hope the answer for you is because Vanessa, I am having fun, but there are many valid reasons. You might be a maintainer that is very passionate about some of your projects or the vision for the future. And you also care a lot about the community and the ecosystem. Now, if you don't wanna be hurting as many cats or octocats in this case, you may be interested in being a project member, which is sort of one level down from maintainer with slightly less responsibility. You may be a worker bee, so your employer or perhaps your advisor is like, you must work on this project. Totally legit reason to participate. You may also be a job seeker. So has if anyone's ever gone on Reddit and seen someone being like, hey, can you check out my portfolio? How does it look for this job prospect? This is also another good reason. You might be a student. I don't mean just in like the academic sense. I mean, like you're a person that likes learning things and you are out there to sample the flavor of open source projects and languages and everything that it has to offer. Ah, the social bee. So funny story, I joined GitHub in 2011, but I didn't really realize until 2015 that it was actually a social network. I could make friends on here and have quite a lot of fun. And finally, there's the code lover. This is totally me. We love programming. We love coding. Beep boop, all the open source. Ah! <laughs> So there are many good reasons to contribute to open source, everything from vision to the future to one I didn't mention, getting your code out there for visibility. So there's a famous piece of writing called the Cathedral in the Bazaar. And there's this idea that many eyes on the code squash the, the bugs. So we want to squash the bugs. And there's one underlying thing here that I want to mention that I, ha that I haven't yet. And that is that we are looking for a sense of belonging. So what am I talking about? Actually, there was a paper, an article that came out about a month ago by Dr. Kat Hicks that articulated this perfectly. So she said, okay, the sense of belonging is this general inference that we make based on everything around us about how well we fit in some kind of setting. And we do this usually to figure out if we belong in a certain role. So she was talking about agile software teams, but this could also be about open source communities. And specifically, we're looking at who else is in the role, what the heck are they doing, why are they doing it, and how it's being done. And we figure out if that agrees with our sense of self, with our own personal values. Ah, speaking of these values, this is the second question that I think is really important to ask when you're doing open source introspection. What do I value? So one thing I've noticed is that when we're interacting with the community, we can tend to compare mindset. So for example, you may have an academic mindset. I am valued based on my papers. We have top-down leadership, student up to professor. We have lots of rules and policy because this organization is huge. When I go to a conference, I must be professional and scholarly and a little bit serious. And also science is the total underlying goal. 
Now you might come from an open source community. Maybe there's not a lot of academics where the value is based on the software, on the work that you do. There's a flat hierarchy. Nobody cares what your title is. Just put in the PR, man, let's talk about it. It's likely project oriented. There might be an overall governance, but ultimately the unit of importance is that project. And the emphasis is on like the goals of the project and having fun. And although science might be a use case, it's not like the only goal of the software. And so one thing I really want to press here is that my advice to you is to just whatever you may think are the important attributes, write them down for yourself. Look at the communities that you care about, write them down and just see how well there's a match in those values. And when you're doing this, you might start to ask like, where did my values come from? Where did the values of this culture come from? And I mentioned this because I noticed something really interesting about a lot of these communities. And that is communities tend to take on the values of their founding members, sort of like graph inheritance in a way. So imagine that you have community A with an academic mindset and they're like, aha, we need to make a community B. It's just really important, it's missing. So they start to make it. So do you think that community B is gonna be drastically different? Or maybe community B is gonna look a lot like A, which makes a lot of sense because community B inherits the values of the founding members from community A. And this isn't bad, it's not to say they did it wrong, it's just that like you can't know what you don't know. And on the one hand, the longer that a community has been around, it's probably harder to change their values. But if you're able to engage with that community early on and be like, hey, I have an idea, maybe we could try this different idea, I think, at least what I've seen, is they'll be more likely to think about it and be like, yeah, let's try that out. So we've talked about why you're contributing to open source, looking at some values. You're ready. Let's find the communities. Where are they again? Yeah, we haven't talked about that. So the next question is, where do I find community? And I want to say you find community in the bakery. No, I'm just kidding. So communities are a lot like cookies in the sense that there's different types and flavors. And in the same way that you can look at an oatmeal cookie and have some expectations about it, what it's going to taste like, what it's going to be, we can do the same thing actually for different kinds of communities. So I present to you the cookbook of community phenotypes, just a couple, of course. So let's start very simply with the abstract cookie. We create communities when we have a need. We make cookies because they're delicious and they're when we're hungry and we want to eat them. So more specifically, we create open source communities when we have a need. And specifically this kind of open source cookie is, is based on a pressing real world need that manifests in a software solution. So I was gonna stand up here today and like tell you the whole story of like Linux and you know, it's a really great story. But then I was like, you know, Vanessa, they can also read Wikipedia. You don't need to do it for them. So I am not also qualified to tell this story. So I wanna tell you a story that I am qualified to tell Yes, hello, wise Yoda dog, I was expecting you. Let's go into a story, shall we? So this starts, this story is about the Singularity software. It starts back in 2014, which was the head of the reproducibility crisis, which sort of, to be fair, started in the 2010s, but really came to a head here. This is when you saw articles like this, the estimating the reproducibility of psychological science. Over half of studies fail. And if you were in the field at the time, you were like, oh my God, this is an affront to my entire work, my entire field. This is really bad. Now, at the same time, you were probably experiencing the magic of container technologies. For me, for Docker, this was 2015 and had first been demoed in 2013. And so very logically, you're like, hmm, problem in science, container technology. Let's push those things together. Ha! Ah, containers for reproducible science, like duh. I mean, at the time it was just so obvious. It was like a piano falling out of the sky and hitting me in the head, except maybe it was a, a whale or something like that. So if you went to your HPC admin and you're like, please install a doctor for me on the cluster, of course they, they said no. So it felt kind of like this, but regrettably so because this would have been a huge security thing to install a root-based daemon, but this is where singularity came in. So with singularity, I wanna point out some pattern in this story. And that's, this is why I think this is a really good example of a pressing role of need that manifests in a software solution. We start with this environment. The environment can be what's going on in academia. It could be technology. It could be a political ecosystem. It is an environment that combines with personal need. So I 
found I loved reusing containers. I wanted to use them for science and I wanted to use them on my cluster to run my science, but I couldn't. And gosh darn it, I wanted to be able to. And so this is like the perfect storm. And under this perfect storm, this is what allowed the Singularity community to be established and flourish, if you, if you remember that. And I believe it's these kind of ingredients and a little bit of luck and chance like of them coming together that lead to a really inspired and excited community of this particular type. So with a, a talk that I gave in 2017 at Perk in Mind, where I said, just give them the sandwich, <laughs> I present you ingredients for open source software communities. The first is that real world problem. You can have the greatest software in the world, but if you don't have people that have an actual problem that need it, you really don't have much at all. You need a path, a direction, a hope that other people can look at and be like, yes, I'm excited about that too. Let's go there together. And you need to be able to talk about it. So very practically communication channels are important. And for fun, you know, also, so when you go to a conference, you're recognizable. It's good to have branding. It's good to have symbols that help, help to unify the community. But there's one more thing, and this might be the hardest, and that is you have to be loud. And for the introverts in the audience, I, I, I get it. Putting yourself at the table, posting on social media when you'd rather be quiet and you feel obnoxious is an incredibly hard mental barrier to go through. But if you don't do that, again, you can do the greatest work in the world, but if you don't tell anyone about it, no one's going to know about it. Alrighty, so the next kind of community cookie that we find is one based on a need for identity and structure for a category of people. So I can look at these cookies. These are Valentine's cookies, right? Mm, they look delicious. And this need can start from a place from feeling different. So you're in a scenario, it's like one of these things is not like the other. And then it's like, oh my God, it's me. I'm the, I'm the other and I'm different. And this is a problem. Personal story time. So for me, I was in graduate school and I, I graduated in 2016, but I wrote this post in early 2016 and it came from a place of feeling different. I said, you know, I love building things and I just went through grad school and I encountered all these problems with reproducibility. And I think there's a missing layer. I'm calling it an academic software developer. We need people at universities that are just working on software like container technologies. And so I didn't see a path for me, but I knew that I, at least I had the direction of working on that specific thing. So I graduated. I worked on Singularity. I gave lots of talks about it. I was sitting in research computing. But the entire time I was like, what am I? I'm not a sysadmin. I'm sitting in research computing in HPC. I'm certainly not an academic. I don't think people would consider me a software engineer. Like, where is my community? And so around this time, this is also when the, the research software engineer movement was coming to the US. I saw this and I was like, oh, are these the academic software developers I was looking for? And actually, uh, so there's a whole talk that I gave on this, but the movement started actually as early as 2012. There's a link to the talk in the bottom if you're interested. It's a very interesting story. It started in the UK and now it's sort of a worldwide movement. And this is the perfect example of one of these sort of role-based communities. And I knew immediately that I wanted to prove that I valued them. So I knew that contribution was a means to assert my value to the community. So I dove in with just two feet. I'm a human, I only have two feet, not four feet, two feet, two arms. I did everything that you can imagine, you know, down to a podcast hosting a, we called it Jeopardy game, and it was a lot of fun. And so this perfect example of a community based around role, I wanna point out that we often look for these communities based on locale. So we look at our institution, our employer, the people sitting around us. But I also want to say that I think after, after more life experience, everything I just said, I think you should be skeptical of. So let me tell you why. The reason is because I think what we really need are people that believe in us and support us. Because when you think about it, searching for a role that title thing is really searching for your own identity. And although it would be totally fantastic to go into like a coffee shop and be like, this is the sign you've been looking for. Congratulations, you've found it. Real life doesn't work like that. Real life 
has paths and you have to decide where to go left or right and then you come to a place without a path and are you going to go into the gnarly woods and get bitten by god knows what and often at times you're going to make good life decisions and find yourself in a beautiful place kind of breezing and flying other times you're going to make really bad life decisions and find yourself walking over a fence in a nasty thing of water getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and the only thing to do is to jump into the nasty water and yeah that that really happened Anyway, with support from a people or even just one person that believes in you, that gives you this safety, the psychological safety to take risks, to learn not just skills, but about yourself and to find that identity. Ah, and it's wise Yoda dog, it's time for another story. <laughs> so in my life, there have been definitely been people that have played that role. My first one was after college. This is Ahmad Hariri in Hariri Lab. He was the first person, he was like V. We have these HPC clusters. We Here's the software I wanna use, go figure it out. He was the first person that believed in me and gave me that freedom to go off and learn and do things. And before that point, I didn't have skills. I was a psychology and World of Warcraft major. I didn't have any confidence. And this was the start of me getting some skill, falling in love with programming and starting to develop confidence that I was a person of value that could do things that other people value too. The next group of people that gave me that same acceptance, psychological safety, actually wasn't until seven years later. And that's an important point because there's big periods of our lives where we don't have that protective structure. And during those times, you just have to be strong. You have to take care of yourself. So when I joined the Poldrack Lab, specifically Russ and Chris on the bottom right, they were the first people really in graduate school to really make me feel like my work was important and support me for the work that I wanted to do. And then finally, after that, my first job after graduate school. So this is Ruth Marinshaw. She's the CTO of Research Computing. What you can't really see easily in that picture is that's actually a Darth Vader pinata. This was a birthday party. It was all of Research Computing and we were killing that pinata and it was super fun. So Ruth, gave me this, this safety where it was the first time that I felt like it might be okay to be myself, to be my authentic self, let my personality out, which is a little bit silly, making bad jokes, a little bit more open than I had ever been. And so to kind of finish this transition, where I am now, this is the Flux and Converge Computing Teams. This is actually a group of people that are across many different kind of groups at the lab. And I absolutely adore these people. I adore the work that we're doing, and I have the ultimate feeling of psychological safety, feeling like I can be my authentic self, and that allows me to be brave, to take risks on ideas and technologies that you know have a high chance of not working out, and if it doesn't work out, that's okay, because I know this group of people is here to support me. And so I want to point out that creativity in our work comes from the psychological safety. Immersion in your interests and being able to focus and not worry about bad things in your environment also comes from psychological safety. And really, I think what we might call life balance, which means different things for different people, also comes from it. And more specifically here, I think it's really important that we take care of our bodies and our minds first, which is something that our Western society <laughs> It's not super great. As we know, in Western society, there's like this epidemic of busyness, like it's so fashionable or something to be busy. Like if you go into a coffee shop, you expect to see like the line that's moving and people are going in and they're going out. And then you see some people sitting and they have their laptops and their little internet, uh, their, their phones and, and they're getting work done. But then you see that one guy who's like, he has his coffee and he's just gently sipping. And you look at him and you're like, what are you doing, you psycho? <laughs> like, it is so terrible that we are so accustomed and normalized to this idea of busyness. I really wish it wasn't like that. And I'm, so I'm going to tell you to try, try to take some time for yourself. So to summarize, where do you find a role-based community? I want you to actually question this. I want when role-based community is what you think you need, pause for a second and question that. Personal growth and discovery is a powerful seed and stability and support might be where it's at. <laughs> so for the for our next kind of community cookie, this is the turducken cookie. 
Is it an oatmeal cookie? Is it a chocolate cookie with walnut and drizzle and something in the middle? No, but so this kind of community is based on a need for connection that's not tied explicitly to a role or project vision. People from all over the place. And so for this story, let's go back in time to last year when this guy took over this social network, mind controlled it, the, the network previously known as Twitter and nobody knows what's going on anymore. But particularly a community member named Alan Sill looked at this and he was like, oh my gosh, all of the HPC communities leaving Twitter, this is the place where we used to talk about things. How can we create an effective human-centric HPC community? What can we do? So he brought a bunch of us together and we talked about it and we ultimately created HPC Social, HPC Practitioners and Friends, just based on this need for connection. And it's really flourished since then. So you can see the resources here. All of these have been very, uh, democratically put together in the sense like we work together, the hierarchy is flat. Resources from, you know, jobs to blogs and places to chat, Mastodon, Twitter, Slack, Discord, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing I've noticed that's interesting is that these communities that often are based around online networks, they often develop into real world interactions. So like you make friends and then, oh my gosh, you see them at supercomputing, which is a, a big conference in high performance computing. And nothing speaks more strongly for the success of a community like this than having a really awesome HPC Dino sticker, not just that, a reflective one that lots of people are excited about. So this is our Slack also, which is really fun, very safe place. And you can see there's almost 300 people in it and it, the community is under a year old. So that is really awesome. I absolutely love interacting with these people and I've made a lot of new friends and I'm learning things too. So where to find this kind of community? Well, gravitate toward your interests, gravitate to where people are having fun and you are definitely gonna find them. Alrighty, so you've joined the community now you kind of want to figure out like, how am I valued? Am I valued? And off, I bring this up because oftentimes it's the case that a community says one thing and they do another thing and you're like, these two things are, do not make sense together. <laughs> so let me give you an example of when actions speak louder than words or actions speak when words mislead. They may say, and this is actually a very common one, like, yes, we value diversity. We have the DEI group and we have DEI day. And, you know, this, this picture is on our website. But when you look at leadership, it is majorly one demographic. They might also say we believe in equality. But then when you go into a code review, you realize that your code review was 120, you know, comments long is consistently that and everyone else seems to be like LG to me, looks good to me, like no problem. And then finally, they may say like, we value open discussion and opinions, but if you post something that someone disagrees with, they are going to report you for having them. And especially that last point, I wanna bring up that for all of these things, the reporting thing is like an anonymous way of avoiding a discussion with someone. So for all of these points I brought up, they're all opportunities for discussion. Anytime there is disagreement, it's an opportunity for discussion. So here are the example. Okay, this code review was off. Should we have some kind of standard protocol? You know, there, the, can we think more about the election process? Oh, you think differently than me. Well, why do you feel that way? And so disagreement or conflict is opportunity for discussion. And in fact, the most mature communities expect it and grow from it. And there's a point that's really important that I want to bring up is that in the case where you disagree with someone, always choose communication over accusation. It's so easy to go to a code of conduct and report someone anonymously and try to get rid of them as opposed to saying, you know, I disagree with you about that statement. Can we talk about it and can we learn from each other? But in the same respect, you know, it is one thing to say like, yes, you have a negative experience and you can inspire change, but like, I can't belittle this, the idea that when we have these negative experiences, they feel really bad, right? Like they give us that imposter syndrome. We have a bad experience. We look around, we're like, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. I'm gonna go find a pond somewhere and go upside down and stick my butt in the air. I mean, that's not what I do, but if that's what you do, that's totally cool. And so I wanna make the point that when you engage with communities, when you're trying on an identity, it is okay to do that and change your mind. 
And one of the most important things we learned throughout our career is to be able to say yes to something, to say no to something, but also to say not anymore. And this not anymore part is one of the hardest things because often it means that we had previously said yes and then we decide to step away. But a lot of times in this decision to step away, it's realizing that we're not being valued in the way that we want to be valuable. And so it's a choice to be like, you know what? I am brave enough to recognize that I have worth and my time has value. And I don't think my values are lining up here or I'm not being treated the way that I want. And I know that I've put a big investment in this community, but I'm gonna step away because I am a valuable person and I want to be somewhere where, where they see that. So in this process, self-compassion is key. And I wanna share with you a quote from Bruce Wilson at Oak Ridge National Lab. I think this was about agile teams, but I just, I just really like the idea for self-compassion because it's not just how you think about other people in sort of a you know, retroactive, re retrospective report. It's also how you think about yourself in the past. So the idea is that we truly understand that people did the best job they knew how to do at the time they did it with the skills and the information that they had. Because it's so easy to look back on what you decided or hack even your code and be like, oh my God, <laughs> this is absolutely terrible. Like who wrote this? It wasn't me. Oh my God, it wasn't me. But we have to have self-compassion and face, uh, face ourselves with that. All right, so last point, how do I create culture? So creating culture is also changing culture because in changing culture, you're also kind of creating new ideas. So this often comes from sort of like in Madeline when the nun wakes up in the night, something is not right, something is not right. And actually there are many derivations of that. So it could be something as small as like, okay, I just came out of this interaction and it was really stressful. It could be something like, you know, we could do this better. Something's missing, this environment is toxic. It's, it's all, not always, but it's often the case that a community value is different from our own and we feel cognitive dissonance from that. And so the first common reaction is like, ah, get me out of here, I don't want to feel this, but actually I wanna suggest that you use the nudge approach. So the nudge approach starts out with just first asking what do you wanna change and why? Because sometimes we have like emotional reactions to things where like, oh, that sucks, and then everything's terrible, and like from office space, you're like, I'm going to burn it all down, but really, then we come back with a level head, and we're like, actually, yeah, it's, it's probably fine, so once you're convinced of that, though, then what I like to do is to formulate my ideas into basic questions, so for example, let's say I'm in a, a working group meeting, and there's someone there that's like very controlling and dictating, and you know, lots of other people aren't speaking, I might step back and be like, hmm, this is kind of about leadership, like, what do I think is leadership and how does that compare to what's happening here? Well, maybe there's this model where we make decisions together and that's sort of bottom up. And there's this other model that's top down where like someone is telling everyone to do, which one's a better fit for my community or my working group? And if it's not perfectly black and white, maybe there's some middle ground. And so you take the, these questions and you formulate it and I deal before and after like okay before it's like this one person is controlling everything and after lots of people are speaking their mind and so what do you do next do you ask for permission you go to the meeting you're like okay like you were kind of mean last time and like pretty please can we just do it this way absolutely not that usually doesn't work for many reasons that I don't have to get into but more importantly I'll also ask the sub question we often I've noticed Seek the validation of others first for ideas. So for example, if you have a really cool idea for software or whatever, you often want others to validate the idea first. But here's the thing, if you went to someone else and you believe so strongly in something and they said, that's a terrible idea, like I think it's terrible, you know, would you really change your thinking about it? And so what I wanna suggest is like a proof in the pudding approach is more convincing. So to go back to our nudge approach, what I like to do is to take the ideal before and after, match that to a simple action like, okay, I'm gonna come up with guidelines for this working group meeting. Maybe there'll be a structure to the meeting um, with, a, with a way that people interact. I'm gonna do all the hard work and I'm gonna bring it to this meeting. And I'll say, you know, I came up with this plan, I did all the work really you know, low risk for you. Can we just try it once? Can we just, it, it's just so easy. When you present it like that, it's very easy to say yes. And then maybe they'll try it and they'll like it. And that's sort of the nudge approach. Like, oh, just try it once a little bit. 
Okay, so we finished asking these questions. And I first wanna say, these are not the only questions. They are not the right questions. They are questions that I came up with because I think they have a kind of logical flow. Let me explain. This first question is about figuring out if it's really the path that you want to pursue. Some people do things because they think that's what they should be doing because someone else told them to do it. But you should really figure out if that's what you want to do. Once you do that, while there's so many different communities out there, you need some filter criteria. And I think I wanna suggest that they're based on your values. Once you've done some filtering, well, then you need to kind of look at your options that are available and have a way to organize them. Once you start engaging, you need a way to evaluate them based on how you're valued back. And then finally, <laughs> when you're actually engaging these communities, then you can contribute contrib change. And this is a really cool setup because when you're contributing change, it actually loops back and then you influence the options for of communities that exist. And it's like the circle or the, the loop of life. Alrighty, so after all this, maybe you're a mature person, mature career person, uh, and, and you wanna know like, how do I know if I'm in the right place? Oh, you'll know. So I'm not saying that everyone is like me and kind of rocks out with, um hands on their bed. But what I found is that when I had that psychological safety, when I knew that what I was working on was being valued and the things that I cared about for the future vision of, you know, technologies, they were also shared by my peers. This is when I just totally have flourished. So this is just in the past, you know, year the, just the exciting amount of work and talks, like they, they speak for themselves. And to kind of articulate this more into a list, I will say that you know that you're in the right place when you're excited about your work and you're excited about the goals and visions of your teams. You feel like you're working on it together. You have psychological safety. You can go into a meeting and you're not very kind of self-conscious and self-monitoring what you say. You can speak your mind freely. You feel supported even when you aren't even in the room. And this is a new one for me, but I started to realize that I was being supported by my colleagues when I wasn't there. And that just totally overwhelmed me with just happiness. You may get presented with other opportunities that maybe in another time in your life, you would have just immediately said yes to, but now you're like, you know, I'm really happy right now. And thank you, but no, thank you. And maybe this is just me because I, I feel emotions strongly, I suppose. You will tend to feel more joy, happiness over stress and sadness. I think most humans can relate to that. So some advice for the open source community. I hear this phrase a lot that we need to find our people. And I've definitely used it myself. But I'm starting to think that we don't really need to find our people. We need to find others, even just one person, that give us support and embrace us for our authentic selves, that value us for the work that we want to do. I think that it's most important to find community based on these shared goals, vision, values, and not necessarily a role. We're, we're very obsessed in our society with putting ourselves in buckets. What bucket should I go in? I don't really think we need to be in buckets. I also think you should take care of yourself first. Don't be too busy. That's very hard. So like say no more, a little more than you do. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Proof in the pudding approach, show them and don't look for validation of your ideas first because often you may not get it. Also, everything is about leaning. Lean toward the people and experiences that value back. When someone doesn't value or they don't treat you the way you want to be treated, that's when you lean away. And also think about identity or limitations of these role-based groups. And I mention this because there are a lot of role-based groups, and I'm not sure that is sort of the best structure to have, but it totally depends on what you're trying to achieve. So minimally, I'm not saying one is right or wrong. I just want to encourage you to think about it. And I truly believe in this entire ecosystem of open source and research that if you find yourself first, you will find community too. <laughs> so thank you.
I'm Vanessa. Uh, that's my email for my job on Twitter, GitHub, Mastodon. I'm VSOC on Slack. So I'm just V. I apologize. One letter. It's terrible for searching. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a fantastic conference. We'll chat later. <laughs>